Welcome to Court Video's presentation of the insanity trial of Wisconsin versus Jeffrey Dahmer, the serial killer. The two questions needed to prove his insanity are, number one, did Jeffrey Dahmer have a mental disease? And number two, could he control himself? We're about to get underway, so let's proceed. Uh, the Rather than a dead body, he preferred a live body. He would preferred a totally compliant live body. And that meant a drugged body, and he preferred the body drugged. It was a diminution when the body, when life was taken. It wasn't as, as interesting. He liked to hear the heart. He liked the, the, the aliveness of the body, but the drug only lasted so long. Indeed, he told the police that he tried to extend it with ether. They found ether in the apartment. That he tried to keep them under when the drug, after a period of time, the drug would wear off, uh, he couldn't artificially, didn't have intravenous apparatus to, to in, put the drug in. So as they try to come out of it, he experienced, he attempted to extend the drug period by the use of ether, but he was not successful in that attempt. Uh, and eventually, he heard one time uh, on, on TV or radio that you could freeze. People were dry freezing their pets, and you could dry freeze a, a pet as though it were alive and that he would prefer even that. Uh, uh, the, first, the, the live, very, very compliant person, such a person you do not find, then the drug compliant person, uh, finally the, the, uh, uh, the uh, person, uh, the dry freeze, if you will, and last, the body, uh, having the body, a dead body. That was the last choice, not the first choice. I'd like to talk to you about the law. May we turn that on? Like this. This is the law that you will be deciding, that you will, the judge will be instructing you. 97115, mental responsibility of defendant. The person is not responsible for criminal conduct if at the time of such conduct, as a result of mental disease or defect, he lacks substantial capacity either to appreciate the wrongfulness of his conduct or to conform his conduct to the requirements of the law. All right, there's no issue of defect here. The, everyone agrees Mr. Dahmer is of at least average intelligence. We're not talking about a person that is a mental defective. That's not in this picture at all. So the issue is mental disease. And there will be discussion and debate, dis disagreement between the psychiatrists on this. There is what's called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association. They list what they call mental disorders. And paraphilias is one of those mental disorders. It's a new type of word. Uh, it, uh, the, the old word used to be sex deviant. That was a word that some viewed as an insulting word uh, because of the various categories that were under that. And the word paraphilia is a relatively new word. The, de the deviation that would be involved here would be in the interest in a dead body, a sexual interest in a dead body. Well, the newer word for it is called a paraphilia. And the doctors for the defense and the doctors for the state will say, yes, he had a paraphilia. He did take pleasure out of a dead body and that is a, referred to as a disorder within that manual. However, the doctor will say, Dr. Deese particularly will say, that that mental disease is not, that you see in this statute, is not the type of mental disorder that they're talking about in that manual. And indeed, that manual on its face will tell you that you can't overlap the two. Merely because it's called a mental disorder in the manual, the manual itself warns you that that doesn't mean it's going to be a mental disease under the law. So there will be a discussion about that. You will hear testimony about that. And then you will hear testimony about whether he lacked substantial capacity to either appreciate the wrongfulness of his conduct or to conform his conduct to the requirements of the law. And these are some of the examples that you will see in terms of, of, of to appreciate it. When Dr. Dietz, and I'd like to take a minute or two to introduce Dr. Dietz in his absence. Dr. Dietz is, a, is educated at the Cornell Medical School, also took some a, a Cornell undergraduate. Uh, took advanced uh, medical education and advanced psychiatry and studied in that process at Johns Hopkins. Uh, he went to Harvard and taught at Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Went to the University of, uh, of uh, Virginia where he held uh, an assistant position, assistant professor position in both the faculty of law and the faculty of medicine. Uh, he was the key government uh, psychiatrist in the Hinckley case. He has testified on other serial murder cases. Uh, he has uh, written on serial murder cases, has lectured on serial murder cases, uh, and uh, will bring to bear that experience. I will also ask you to check his thoroughness. Watch the number of hours that he spends before he formulates his opinion. The doctors formulated their opinions and submitted them to the court 
prior to January 10, 1991. The court ordered it, as is proper under the statute, that those opinions be submitted. See the number of hours, the thoroughness with which the respective doctors, all of them, I invite you to measure my doctors against it, measure the defendant's doctors. How many hours did you spend with the defendant interviewing him? Did you get all the facts? Did you discuss all the cases? How did you handle it? Did you work independently and so on? I invite you to evaluate my experts. I urge you to evaluate. When we were doing the voir dire, I asked you to consider qualifications and thoroughness and experience. I invite you to do that. All right, Dr. Dietz, in talking with the defendant over a three-day period that he talked with him, he, Dahmer told him that at the time that he killed each of these 15 victims, he appreciated that it was wrong to kill the victim. He further told Dr. Dietz that the fact that Mr. Dahmer, in some instances, took steps to reduce the chances that he would be identified as the last person seen with the victim. We're talking about his knowing that it's wrong. He doesn't want to be seen because he knows that it's wrong. The fact that Mr. Dahmer, in each instance, committed the charge defense in a private setting, hidden from the view of others. You sometimes have heard of, his, of an irresistible impulse. There was a case in Michigan of a person, an angry man, rushing into a crowded bar and shooting someone else when he heard that this man had, had violated his wife, going right in front of a crowd and shooting somebody. Um, hidden, and that Mr. Dahmer, all these cases, all these incidents hand, were done out of view. The fact that Mr. Dahmer found it necessary to drink alcohol to overcome his inhibitions against killing the victims. He told the psychiatrist how he had to drink the alcohol to, just to, to get down his inhibitions before he would go on killing. The fact that Mr. Dahmer feared being caught in the killing a victim or in the presence of a drugged, comatose, or dead or dismembered victim. Didn't want to be caught there because he knew it was wrong, obviously. The fact that Mr. Dahmer took elaborate steps to destroy evidence of his crimes and to hold it uh, to get rid of the bodies and to hold it against secure against discovery by others, including his techniques for disposal of bodies uh, and for, for at one point he concealed the head in, in various cases and so on, how he secured his apartment, how he locked it, how he marked it with that it was protected with an alarm, how he had an alarm, how he put in this dummy camera, all of it reflecting he knows what he's doing is wrong. If he thought it wasn't wrong, he wouldn't be doing that, obviously. And then he painted the skulls. At one point, he painted the skulls because he was afraid someone would see them and think they were real. So he got some spray paint and painted them so that they would look artificial. You perhaps have yourself seen artificial skulls. In terms of whether he had the control, capacity to control himself, I think, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this particular point, he lacked substantial capacity to appreciate the wrongfulness of his conduct. Uh, Mr. Mr. Boyle did not speak to that issue when he lectured to you, when he spoke to you. I have spoken to it. I have told you that Mr. Dahmer said often when he was asked, yes, he knew that it was what he was doing was wrong. He said it to the police, said it to our psychiatrists, uh, and I do not know if you'll see any evidence to the contrary. All right, what about the capacity to control? Did I keep that free? That light? Would you turn it on as if that's possible? Let me speak to it. Apparently the light has burned out. The issue of control, and was he able to control himself? I've addressed on that a number of times, touching even with the first case, the jogger case, where he didn't have to go out ravenous through the park looking for someone to knock down. The jogger didn't appear, and that was it. And he didn't do anything. He said he was 15 or 16. He didn't do anything until, until the, the Hicks incident was two years later. Two years later that he decided to act uh, and, uh, in the Hicks incident, all through the military, uh, and uh, that he did not assault any. And when he was at his grandmother's house, the period that he was uh, uh, on work release, that he didn't assault anyone. That he went down to the bathhouses and didn't assault anyone in the bathhouses in Chicago. Never broke into an apartment to assault anybody. No evidence that he a man out of control breaks into an apartment and assaults and kills another man so they can have his dead body. No evidence that he grabbed anybody on the street and used force to pull him off the street. Always a carefully controlled environment where he picks a man that has no car, brings him back to his place where he operates, where he has the drugs ready, he's prepared the drugs, he's got an environment that's protected where he's not going to be discovered, and so forth. 
I'm going to touch upon some of the items that Dr. Dietz points out as evidences of the, of the control that the defendant had in his professional opinion. The fact that Mr. Dahmer told him, Dahmer told Dr. Dietz that at the time he killed each of these 15 victims, he would have refrained from doing so had the victims agreed to remain with him voluntarily for a few weeks. If they had said no, Weinberger came up for two days, the, guy, the man from Chicago, Weinberger. He didn't kill him the first day. He enjoyed him. The second day, when Weinberger starts, he's got to go back to Chicago, that's when he kills Weinberger. And what he told Dietz is, no, if they had stayed for a couple of weeks, I would not have killed them. He wanted them alive. He wanted the pleasure while they were alive. Second, the fact that Mr. Dahmer told Dr. Dietz that at the time he killed each of these 15 victims, he would have refrained from doing so had a witness entered the room under control, would not have proceeded for witness. You can think of the Flowers case, where the grandmother discovers that there's a man in the house. That's it. That's the end of the plan for Flowers. He does not proceed to kill Flowers. Same with, with the, the juvenile the, uh, that, he, that, he, that struggled with him, that he hit with a mallet that he struggled with. Uh, he did not, he let that man go when he uh, came to his senses, let that man go too. The fact that Dahmer, uh, third, the fact that Mr. Dahmer was able to suppress his sexual behavior other, uh, by, other than occasional masturbation for prolonged periods of time in the military at his mother's house, at the grandmother's house and so on. The fact that Mr. Dahmer was able uh, to satisfy his, his sexual desires with, with masturbation at all times. The fact that Mr. Dahmer did in fact satisfy him ex himself exclusively with, with masturbation from about 1973 until the murder of Mr. Hicks in 1978. And from that time until the, 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 the Tuolumne incident, indeed until the incident after that, the, where, where, these, where he had whatever he had, whatever those desires were, he maintained them under, under control. The fact that Mr. Dahmer prepared himself for some of the murders by clearing spaces in his apartment for victim storage, by powdering the tablets in advance. In a number of the cases, he powdered the tablets before he went out to look for a victim uh, and have the tablets ready so then he would turn, he would be prepared to drug them, to proceed with them sexually as he wished. Uh, and by having, mo occasionally working himself up by watching movies that featured evil or power particularly powerful characters. The fact that Mr. Dahmer generally limited the murders to the weekends when he would have had sufficient time to enjoy the sex with the drugged person and then afterwards with the dead body. The fact that Mr. Dahmer did not kill any of the men he was attracted to while in bars or on the street or at the mall or in the peep show booths. It was always controlled, always controlled, back to his house. We now begin an odyssey, the results of which in a short period of time will result in a decision to be made by you and you alone as to whether or not Jeffrey Dahmer did, at the time he committed these horrific murders to which he has pled guilty, whether or not he was suffering from a mental disease, the result of which that he lacked substantial capacity to either appreciate the wrongfulness of his conduct or to conform his conduct to the requirements of law. It is very difficult for an advocate not to be an advocate, not to argue, not to try and convince at all stages. I cannot attempt to convince you of anything now. The time for that to happen will come in what's called closing argument. When I will say in closing argument that as it relates to some, one, or all of these offenses that I have proved to a reasonable certainty by the greater weight of the credible evidence that Mr. Dahmer was not responsible because of this mental disease and the legal definition of insanity as I've said it. Now, I know from having been with you folks for the last three days that we have a jury here that is fresh, that has no opinion and is going to listen to the evidence. But it's very difficult for you to understand what the rest of us understand because we've been working on this case for so many months. And we are here trying to tell you things for not any other reason 
than to hopefully make you understand as this is progressing down the road of evidence as to what is happening in this courtroom so you can say, good, I understand it. If I were trying to explain to you the game of football, in order for you who have just come in from some place that never saw the game played, it might take me hours, if not weeks, for you to understand all the nuances. What I am doing here in a very, very brief period of time is trying to lay out for you what I say I have accepted to be my burden, and that is my burden, and I understand that. So in that regard, what I want to do is to tell you to completely disregard that long list of witnesses that I read to you. Because now that we're at this point in time, certain decisions had to be made by myself with the advice and counsel of the people who are assisting me as to how this case should proceed. And it really hasn't varied for a long period of time, but we had to name a lot of witnesses because at the last moment if something became important, and we hadn't put that witness's name down, we might be foreclosed. And that's why both Mr. McCann and I have done what we've done. <clears throat> and I would like to tell you how this case is going to be proceed, proceed before I get into some of the other details. I anticipate, and I know, that the judge is going to give you some general idea as to what Mr. Dahmer pled guilty to, the 15 counts. You see, there are 17 homicides, but 15 charged. The evidence is going to show that the first homicide took place in a place called Bath, Ohio, in the year 1978. That the second homicide took place in Milwaukee, but because of the nature of the homicide, it was not a charged homicide, but it's going to be discussed. It's going to be discussed. Everything's going to be discussed, but that certainly is going to be discussed. The rest of the homicides that took place took place in Milwaukee County, you will, be made know, you will be made known about every aspect of it. And the person that's going to speak to you about every aspect of it is Jeffrey Dahmer. But he is going to speak to you through the members of the Milwaukee Police Department, the first of whom I'm going to summon as my very first witness. And that is the detective and or detectives, dependent upon how they want to split up the testimony, who are going to read a very, very, very long confession to you. And this confession is going to have details that will cause you to be uncomfortable, but I'm sure that you will listen to the words for the purposes that you must know all of this information. Because subsequent to this confession, Jeffrey Dahmer talked to a lot of other people. He talked to a whole bevy of psychiatrists and psychologists and others. And the reason he did that was because every citizen in this country has an absolute right to have it investigated as to whether or not when they did any act, any act, that they were of sound mind. On the, on the night of Mr. Dahmer's arrest, a man by the name of Tracy Edwards was present with Mr. Dahmer. The evidence is going to show that he was about to be the next victim. Through fate, he did not become a victim, and the saga of Mr. Dahmer ended at that time, and in fact, began at that time. It was subsequent to his arrest, very shortly thereafter, as the police will tell you, as Detective Murphy or Detective Kennedy will tell you, that Mr. Dahmer confessed to all, to everything. As best he could, under the constraints that he was placed in, he gave a full and complete statement to the Milwaukee Police Department, to the officers from Bath, Ohio, to the officers from the West Dallas Police Department, because in fact, acts took place in West Dallas, and one act took place in Bath, Ohio. And you're going to hear every bit of that. <clears throat> and I want to say unequivocally a number of things that I think the evidence is going to show. This was not racial. 
The evidence is going to show, if you hear the testimony of Mr. Dahmer as told to the Milwaukee Police Department and as told to the doctors, Dr. Becker, Dr. Wallstrom, and Dr. Berlin, that Mr. Dahmer's obsession was to body form, not color. It is also a fact, as you know, that there was a lot of homosexual tendencies here, and the obsessiveness of Mr. Dahmer was clearly in the vein of fulfilling his sexual desires, which happened to be of a homosexual nature. This is not a case about homosexuality. That even as an early teenager, he started becoming interested in bones of dead animals. He would take them home, he would bleach them, he would study them. None of this was discovered by any members of his family. None of the interests that he had were known <coughs> to his family. The doctors are going to testify that basically his early years were unremarkable, no greatly different than most, but a few things different that they will tell you what you might consider the import of that to be. It was when he was 14 years of age, as uh, he has told uh, the parties, and, and I'm confident at this juncture when Detective Murphy and Detective Kennedy testify, you will get some understanding and you'll be able to judge the credibility of Jeffrey Dahmer in his dealings with all the parties concerned. But it was when he was about 14 years of age, he first came up with the idea of using a corpse for sexual purposes. He fantasized either having a corpse or a mannequin to use, and it was at that time that he had his first actual consensual homosexual encounter with a peer. He discovered his homosexuality and accepted it. He will tell you through the doctors he didn't understand it, but it caused him no concern other than the fact that he realized what he was. It was while he was in high school that this fantasy of his, doing things with dead things, started showing up when in a biology class he dissected a baby pig and took the, the head home with him, took the skin off and kept the skull. Two doc, three doctors are going to come into this courtroom and they're going to tell you that their opinion is that Jeffrey Dahmer suffers from a mental disorder and it is called paraphilia. Without my trying to be a doctor and defining it for you, except generally, paraphilia is an arousal of a sexual nature to an inanimate object, a body part, or a process. And this paraphilia, there's all kinds of paraphilias. And the doctors are going to tell you about the different kinds of paraphilias. But the paraphilia that best exemplifies the paraphilia that Jeffrey Dahmer had which they will claim is, in their opinion, a mental disorder, which they will state in Jeffrey Dahmer was a mental disease. Their paraphilia that they found was necrophilia. And necrophilia is a disorder of the mind where there is a desire to have sexual contact with dead bodies. That's what they're going to say Jeffrey Dahmer was. He was a lot more than that, but that's the mainstay of his condition, was his desire for dead bodies, to have sex with dead bodies. Armed with that information, here now, I'm going to continue on in the chronology of Jeffrey Dahmer's life so that you may understand how that embryo of that may fit, as the doctors will testify. There came a time in 1975 or 76 that Jeffrey Dahmer's obsession with this sexual desire and fantasy and obsession got to the point where he saw a man who lived somewhere in the general area where he lived running, jogging every day. He would see him jogging down the road 
And he became so attached to the concept of having sex with this man that he went home and he sawed off a baseball bat so that he could get on his bike and ride past the man and hit him in the head with the baseball bat and knock him out. So I was to take him up into the woods and have sex with him. That's what his quest was. And he put that quest in the play and got on that bicycle and went out to find this man. And thanks be to God, the man had never jogged that way again. So it didn't happen. But the doctors are going to tell you what that meant in the grand scheme of things as it is to the mind of Jeffrey Dunn. Beginning when he was about 16 years of age, and this would be in the years of 76, 77, he started collecting animals, always dead animals. And there's going to be testimony as to why that's significant. Never killed a live animal, but would go on the roads and find roadkill dogs, other type of animals that had been struck by cars that were laying there. And he would take them home, and he started having a fascination of wanting to see what they looked like inside. And he would open them up. One time, he took off the head of a dog and put it on a stake and hung it out so that everybody could see it, primarily for shock value. This obsession of this dead animals and doing things with them started becoming something that became more and more into his life, into his head. Detective Kennedy, uh, what were the circumstances under which you uh, became uh, aware of Mr. Dahmer? And <clears throat> would you tell the court and the jury how that came about, please? I was working uh, on a homicide squad on the late shift. My partner, Michael Dubas, and myself were sent to Mr. Dahmer's apartment uh, to investigate a head which was found in the refrigerator. And that apartment was located at 924 North 25th Street in the city and county of Milwaukee? That's correct, sir. What apartment was Mr. Dahmer's apartment? What was the number? Number 213. Did you have occasion at that time to make some observations concerning that apartment? Yes, sir, I did. But since I've already informed everyone here that we're going to only talk about the statement, we'll limit that aspect of your testimony to that, okay? Yes, sir. All right. Did you start talking to Mr. Dahmer about anything? While I was in the apartment, sir? Yes, sir. No, sir. Did you have occasion to transport him from the apartment? Yes, sir, I did. And, and who did you transport him with? Uh, <clears throat> in a Milwaukee police uh, van, which is used to convey prisoners, Squad 93, uh, police officer Alan Chesel and myself. So you started taking him down where, downtown? That's correct, sir. And he was in custody? Yes, sir, he was. You advised him of his constitutional rights? Yes, sir, I did. You told him about all of his rights? Yes, sir. Did you ask him if he wanted to make a statement? Yes, sir, I did. And did he make such a statement to you? Yes, sir. All right. <clears throat> you also advised him that he <clears throat> that he had a right not to have an attorney if he wished. Is that that you? is correct. Okay. All right, tell us what you uh, said to Mr. Dahmer and what he said to you uh, during the time that you were present with him where Detective Murphy was not, okay? Yes, sir. Would you Let like me to read from, from the exhibit if you wish? Okay, sir. He admitted that he had been arrested in the past and states he is currently on probation for taking Polaroid pictures of a minor. Subject states that when he was 18 years of age and living in Richfield, Ohio, he picked up a hitchhiker whom he described as a white male about 19 years of age. He states he took him home and had homosexual sex with him and states they were drinking beer and became intoxicated. He states they got into a physical fight because the 19-year-old individual tried to leave and that during the fight, he states he struck the hitchhiker with the barbell. He states that the blow of the barbell caused the death of the hitchhiker. And at this time, he took the body out into a wooded area by his house and left it there to decompose for about two weeks. Let me, let me stop there. Did you know that there had been such a murder or a homicide that had taken place when he was 18 years of age at the time that you were talking to him? No, sir, I did not. So he volunteered at the commission of a murder? That's correct, sir. Is that the first murder that he told you about? Yes, sir, it is. And you didn't have him on any other murder charges at that time, did you? I realized that there was a head in the refrigerator. I understand that. But, but no, you didn't sir, have did. a murder. You didn't say you're under arrest for the murder of. No, sir. Okay, go ahead. Continue after. 
he states he returned with a sledgehammer at this time and used it to break the bones and then he scattered them about the woods. The subject states he moved to Milwaukee after a three-year tour in the Army and a one-year stay in Miami, Florida, where according to the subject, nothing of this nature happened. Subject states he moved in with his grandmother at 2357 South 57th Street when he returned to Milwaukee. And he states that when he was about 25 years of age and living in Milwaukee, he picked up a white male approximately 25 years of age at the 219 Tavern. He states they got a room at the Ambassador Hotel and they got very drunk and passed out. Subject states when he woke up, the guy was dead and had blood coming from his mouth. Let me stop you. Did you know of that homicide at the time that he volunteered it? No, sir, I did not. Continue on, please. He states he went to the mall and bought a large suitcase and stuck the dead body into it. He states he called a cab and placed the suitcase into it and went back to 2357 South 57th Street. He states that he took the dead body down his basement near a floor drain and used a knife to cut the flesh off the body and then dismember the body, placed the various parts into plastic bags and then threw them into the trash. The subject feels this occurred in 1984 during the summer. He indicates that there had been many times that he has had sex with men where no violence was involved and states that about two months after this incident, he met a Hispanic male about 18 years of age, also at the 219 Club at about 1 a.m. They went back to his grandmother's place and had sex and put sleeping pills in his drink. He states when the guy fell asleep, he strangled him with his hands and took the body down the basement by the drain and used a knife to dismember him and a sledgehammer to break up the bones and then placed them in plastic bags and threw them into the trash. Detective Kennedy, did you know of that homicide at the time you were talking to Mr. Dahmer? No, sir, I did not. Continue out, please. He goes on to state about a month later, he met a black and white mixed male, about 20 years of age, at the Lacage, a tavern on National Avenue, and took him back to his grandmother's house where he had sex and used sleeping pills with him. He states when he was asleep, he strangled him and then dismembered his body and disposed of him in the same manner as before. Did you know of that murder at the time you were talking to Mr. Dahmer? No, sir, I did not. Go ahead. The subject states a year went by and he met a Hispanic male, about 19 years of age, at the 219 Club and returned with him to his grandmother's house where he again had sex, used sleeping pills, and strangled him, and again dismembered and disposed of the body in the same way. Once again, you didn't know about that homicide? No, sir. Go ahead. Subject states he moved to 808 North 24th Street and lived there for a year and was arrested one time for taking pictures of a minor. After one year of work release from the House of Correction, he moved back to his grandmother's house and lived there for approximately six months. At this time, he moved to 924 North 25th Street, apartment 213. Subject states in the winter of 89, he met a black male about 24 years of age in front of the bookstore on 27th Street and took him to his apartment where he took pictures of him in various sexual poses and had sex with him, and put sleeping pills and a coffee and rum drink which he gave to the black male. When the black male fell asleep, he stabbed him with a large hunting knife, which he described as having a six inch blade and a black handle. He stabbed him in the neck. After the guy was dead, he put the body in the bathtub and dismembered him. He states he used the knife to dismember him. The subject states he used a plastic trash container or garbage bag and put the bones in it with hydrochloric acid and let them sit for about three days until they turned to a mushy substance. And then he flushed them down the toilet. The subject states that he filleted from the body, from the, the subject states the flesh he filleted from the body he put into trash bags and threw them out. You didn't know that homicide, did you? At the time you're talking? No, sir. Go ahead. The subject states he also, starting with the third victim, boiled the heads in a cl cleaning solution and kept the skulls. He kept the skulls in the closet. All identification and jewelry of the victims, he states he cut up and threw out into the garbage. The subject states about two months later, he met a black male about 20 years of age around Wisconsin and water and walked home with him and again had sex, used sleeping pills, which was placed in a coffee mixture and strangled him. He then dismembered the body and disposed of him in the same manner as before. You did not know of that murder? No, sir. Go ahead. 
The subject states he began getting quicker at cutting up the bodies. The subject states about one month later, he met a tall black male about 26 years of age at the Se La Vie, and they took a taxi home to his apartment, and he repeated the same scenario with him, but did not boil and keep his head. The subject states this was due to time constraints. Subject states about six months later, he met a black male about 20 years of age while in Chicago and rode back to Milwaukee by Greyhound bus. He states before this, he met a Chinese male about 15 years of age at the Grand Avenue Mall. This was around May or early June. He states they took a bus back to his apartment. It was during the day or the afternoon. He states the Chinese male posed for Polaroid photos and then he gave him sleeping pills and the coffee and rum drink. After he passed out, he strangled him and dismembered and disposed of his body parts in the same way as before. Once again, these last two or three murders he's talking about, you had no idea about. That's correct, sir. Go ahead. The subject states that the body parts gave off an awful smell in the trash, but no one ever did anything about it, so he just kept following his usual procedure of disposal. Regarding the black male from Chicago, he states that he repeated his usual actions with him. Regarding the head in the refrigerator. Now, let me stop you there. Uh, at the time that you were there, and, and understanding we're talking primarily about the confession, there was a head found in the refrigerator of the apartment. That's correct, sir. It was not identifiable as to whose skull that had been, correct? Not at that time, sir. Okay, no. continue talking. Regarding the head in the refrigerator, he states he met him, a black male about 25 years of age, at 27th in Wisconsin, and took him home and repeated the same actions with him. He states about one month ago, he bought a 57-gallon industrial drum and began placing body parts in it. Subject states on about 7-19 of 91, he met a white male about 25 years of age near Marquette University and took him home, had sex with him, gave him sleeping pills and the coffee rum drink, strangled him and filleted him in the bathtub, dismembered him and placed the body parts in the industrial drum. Another homicide you did not know about. That's correct, sir. Go ahead. Regarding the Chinese male, the subject states that after giving him sleeping pills, he fell asleep, and he, the subject, went to the bar on 27th Street. He states that as he left the bar, he saw the Chinese guy running down the street naked, and the police saw him and stopped him. And he was not speaking any English, so he talked with police and said that he was a friend, a friend of his and that he was staying with him. At this time, he took the Chinese guy back to his apartment gave him some more coffee and rum solution with the sleeping pills in it. And after he fell asleep again, he strangled him, dismembered him, and disposed of him in the usual way. He then boiled his head. He states it takes about an hour to boil a head. Regarding his last victim, he states that his ID can be found in the bedroom of his apartment. Was that a fact? That is correct, sir. Go ahead. Regarding 723 of 91. That's the, the, the evening or the early morning hours when he was uh, arrested. Yes, sir. The subject states he met a black male about 25 years of age at the mall on Wisconsin Avenue. He states he offered him $20 in cash to let him take some nude pictures of him. Once at his apartment, they drank rum, and he, the subject, got intoxicated. When you say the subject, you mean who? Mr. Dahmer. Okay. Subject states that he tried to put handcuffs on the victim, and the victim ran out and got the police. Subject states he is not sure what happened next because he was drunk. Regarding the handcuffs, he would ask his victims if they would allow him to take a bondage picture with the handcuffs on, and that is how he would get them handcuffed. The subject states there is an ID from the male he met on 27th in Wisconsin in his wallet. Is that a fact? Was that a fact? Yes, sir, it was. Go ahead. The subject states that all his victims knew that homosexual activity was the idea and possibly pictures. At this time, after the subject gave me this statement verbally, I advised him that I would like to write it down verbatim on paper. However, before I did so, I would like to get another detective to sit in and be witness to this statement. He stated he understood and that he wished to cooperate. And at this time, I went and got Detective Dennis Murphy, who entered the room. And together, we reiterated his constitutional rights, which he stated he understood, and that he wished to waive them in order to help us with this investigation. It was during this time that a four-page confession was written out by myself, Detective Kennedy, and read back to the subject, who also read it, and then stated that it was accurate and true. 
and then he signed it Jeffrey Dahmer. He also initialed each page of the four-page confession. It should be noted that during this entire time that I spoke with the subject, Jeffrey Dahmer, he was given numerous cigarettes, four to five cups of coffee, two glasses of water, two cans of Coca-Cola. He was also allowed to use the bathroom upon request. This entire confession started at approximately 1.30 a.m. and finished at approximately 7.15 a.m. After the confession was completely written out, read over and signed by the subject, he was asked if there was anything that he would like to do or if he was hungry. He stated that he was not hungry and probably will not be hungry for a long time. However, he would just like to sit and talk about the offenses a little bit more. The conversation which followed at this time has been recorded by Detective Dennis Murphy, and he will file a detailed supplementary regarding what was said during this interview. You see, the reason that he consumed the bicep because it was big and he wanted to try it. He then stated he didn't want to talk about it anymore. He also stated that he would masturbate in front of the body parts and the skulls that he would collect because it brought back memories of the victims. He said he would put these body parts in formaldehyde and he would boil the skulls to get rid of their skin. He had also spray painted several of the skulls. This will be this is to, uh, reflected in separate reports. He so stated, what, you're, what you're doing in, in that is saying that there's another report that goes into that? Yes, yeah, several. Okay, go ahead. He stated that all the victims he killed, which he believed to be in the vicinity of 15, he did not keep three of the skulls. He stated one of the skulls was from the victim in Ohio, and there were two others of black males. That he did not keep? Correct. He stated he put these two skulls in acid and got rid of them that way. He stated the total length of time that this occurred was about six years, he believed. He stated the type of pills that he used to put the victims to sleep prior to him strangling them are sleeping pills which he had obtained from a Dr. Hong, was H-O-N-G. He stated the reason that he killed these homosexuals and he stated they all were homosexuals was because he wanted to be with them. He stated he kept the skulls of the good looking ones because he didn't want to lose them. He also stated that he felt he could hang on to them if he could in fact kill them and keep their skulls. He stated the last three skulls that were in the refrigerator and not boiled belong to his last three victims. He stated he even spray painted some of the skulls with spray paint so he looked artificial. Mr. Dahmer stated he purchased the spray paint from an art shop on Water Street. Did he tell you why he did that? Just to make them look artificial so no one would realize they were the real skulls. Did you, did, you make, did you make note of that as his reason for doing that? That's in another statement. Okay, continue on please. I then questioned him regarding the torsos in the 57-gallon tank, and he stated one, of, one is that of the Hispanic male from Carroll's Bar, one was from the black male on 27th Street, and the third one was from the black male he met at the bus station in Chicago. I informed him that there was a skeleton recovered in his apartment, and he stated that was from the black male he met in front of the bookstore approximately one year ago. Mr. Dahmer further stated that he would cut off the penis and body parts, put them in formaldehyde to preserve them, and then look at them and masturbate for gratification. He further stated that he had experimented with ether to put people asleep, but it didn't work. Why did he tell you he experimented with ether? Because uh, sometimes he wouldn't have sleeping pills, so he'd try ether, and that it was cheaper, but it didn't work. Okay, continue on. Regarding the other six torsos that apparently are missing and cannot be accounted for, for the amount of heads that had been discovered in the apartment. He stated that these torsos were placed in acid and were eaten away and then flushed on the toilet when they became slush slushy. Mr. Dahmer then stated he remembers another victim. And this homicide occurred about five months ago. And it was a black male about 20 years old who he met on 27th in Wisconsin. He stated he got this individual to pose for him, gave him a drink, and then cut off his skin. He eventually put the skin in acid. He stated he skinned the entire body, then boiled the head of this individual, and subsequently disposed of the body in plastic bags after dismembering it. He stated that when he would strangle this victim, he would use his hands, and about four times he used a black leather type strap. He had bought this strap for this specific purpose. 
Did you did you then go into a different subject matter with him? Yes. What about? He went on to state he felt constantly lonely and empty without direction, and there was no meaning in life for him. His grandmother was a religious woman of the Protestant faith and a regular churchgoer, and talked to him several times about religion and how it could turn his life around. When he first moved to West Allis, he had continual fantasies about homosexuality, and that along with the homosexual fantasies came the urges to dominate, to kill, and dismember other men. He continually fought these urges by going to church with his grandmother, by reading the Bible, and by trying to live his life in an orderly fashion, as he put it, to walk the straight and narrow. He said he constantly had interlocked feelings and fantasies of homosexual behavior, killing and dismembering, and he finally overcame him as he was finding it more and more impossible to continue with the lifestyle of church going and right living. Uh, he was then questioned regarding some skeleton bones that were found in the file cabinet in his basement, in his bedroom at his residence, and he stated that this was from victim number seven, the black male that he met in December of 1990 by the bookstore on North 27th Street. This was the victim that he stabbed in the neck. And he said it was the only victim he stabbed? Yes. He stated that the reason he did this was, be the reason he stabbed him was because of potion that he had given him of the sleeping pills and alcohol was beginning to wear off and this individual is rather strong and muscular, muscular, and he did not feel that he would be able to strangle him successfully without putting up a fight. So he took the knife and stabbed him once along the jugular vein in order to kill him. Stated that because this individual was the most attractive that he had met up until this time, he decided to clean and boil the entire skeleton in the solution of water and soylex and save it. This is, he states this is the reason he kept this individual with him as long as possible. The question regarding victim number 10, who was tentatively identified as Errol Lindsay, say that this is the only victim that he completely took his skin off. He stated that this was done with a very small, very sharp paring knife, and it took him approximately two hours to complete, completely take the skin off this victim. He stated that he also, while doing this, he, was, he left the cartilage, ligaments, and fleshy, fleshy muscular areas all intact. And then he had the equipment available uh, uh, to, to destroy the bodies. To, oh, it yes, became, this had become a, a sick ritual. He would stand naked in the bathroom and so on. This was all something that just got repeated over and over again in a very ritual. Did you ask him why he would stand naked? Um, again, I, I'm trying to sort out, you know, what came exactly from uh, what I asked and so on. What I want him aware of, if, if, if that's acceptable, is that he denied being sexually aroused because I was interested in that issue. He was saying that he didn't want to get blood on, on his clothes um, so that people would notice. I don't remember for sure if he told me or if I got that in other ways, but that's my understanding of what was going on. And this was his way of disposing bodies. He didn't have a car, did he? Uh, no, sir, he did not. He couldn't take the body out five miles out of town and get rid of it, could he? He certainly couldn't have driven in a car. He didn't have a car. Right. And he couldn't have started dropping bodies in the alley behind the house. The police said two or three bodies in the alley. Uh, they'd be saying, we've got a killer here right in this neighborhood, and that would have drawn uh, intense suspicion on the immediate area. Is that true? Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Again, I think, you know, he was also saving parts and there was a, a ritualistic thing, but I don't want to debate that with you. I, I agree with what you're saying. And the cutting up of the bodies was his disposal method, not having a car, not wishing to leave them outside the back door. He had to dispose of the bodies. And indeed, in discussion with you, he described that as part of the disposal uh, effort. Is that correct? That's correct. And that's why he got the barrel to acidify the larger bones so they would be mushy could put them in a bag or flush them down the toilet or put them in a bag and dump them in the dumpster, as he did with a number of the bodies. Is that correct? Yes. Again, he had often done other things uh, with them that I, I don't want to go into detail, but, but certainly the part of uh, being able to dispose them in that fashion and doing it repeatedly in that same way over and over and over again, that's absolutely correct. Did you compare the bot, the particular, that were in the, the particular barrel in terms to see whether it was the basically the bodies of the last uh, four persons or whether he had kept, uh, he kept 
the skull, certainly. But in terms of the barrel, the persons in the barrel, well, actually, the last four people, is that correct, that he had, that he had, uh, uh, that he had slain? Yeah, again, that wasn't terribly critical to the conclusions I was trying to uh, uh, decide about, but, but in reading all the reports and so on, I become aware of who, who was in the barrel and, and so on. Right. And, did you com and that's true of the heads that were, had not been defleshed. That was also true. It was the last floor, four people that he had slain. Is that correct? Um, again, I'm going by memory, but I, I'm sure you're being accurate, and I, I'm certain that must be correct. What I'm saying is that some of that was he was saying, he's given testimony, that the, in terms of getting tired, not taking any particular pleasure in getting rid of those bodies, that it was taking time, uh, and that's, uh, uh, that was part of his disposal program. The point I'm trying to make, doctor, is that he didn't have a car to drop the bodies five miles away. He couldn't drag them down the street and he chose to get rid of them by dismembering them, defleshing them, and getting rid of it in that fashion. Is that true? Yeah, the, uh, just so you know, you explained your thing. I, I just hesitate a bit, and again, I, I'm not trying to learn here everything I might want to learn if I'm gonna you know, publish a paper on necrophilia, and I, I have some suspicions, therefore, that this ritual of spending hours over and over and doing it the same and, and doing it in this bizarre way may not have been uh, only for purpose of getting rid of the body, but may be tied in to his disease. But I didn't go into that because it's not important in terms of these issues. You're describing it as a ritual. Was he doing... Well, he's standing naked, the body's there, he's following in a very set fashion, he's got it almost stereotyped each time. So it, it's ritualistic in the same that it's repeated did... stereotype behavior. He stands naked. If you're going to cut up bodies to get rid of them, and you decide you don't want blood on your clothes, you take off your clothes and you cut up the bodies, don't you? Okay, yes, and again, I, please, I don't want to be argumentative. Let me just be clear. As a psychiatrist, because I'm examining him that way, I'm wondering whether in addition to get rid of him to dispose of the body, it might be tied in somewhat to his disease. It wasn't, given all that I've already seen, and, and, and I was clear on the diagnosis and clear on my findings, necessary to pursue it. In terms of, I want to call your attention to after the Hicks slaying. He described what he did. Eventually, he uh, dismembered, put them in a garbage bag, and undertook to drive to the, uh, apparently, a dump in the area. He was stopped by police. Yes, he was that? given a ticket. Uh, it's at terrible first they, irony for did crossing they at first the think center. he was driving while intoxicated? Yeah, he was uh, apparently quite nervous, as we can now put it together. Uh, he, he, and he tells us, and, and he had uh, the body at that time in bags in the back of the car, and the police stopped him. They even looked and asked him what was in the, the bags, and he said he some garbage he hadn't gotten rid of. He explained he was up late because he'd been worried about his parents' uh, uh, divorce. And, and, and uh, again, the poor officer couldn't have, have known this, but he ended up getting a ticket for driving on the, the left side of the road, and he was allowed to, to leave. And he, he maintained, uh, here is a man, 18, who was just killed the day before a man, has the body in the back seat in garbage bags, a police flashlight, he stopped by the police, it's in the early morning hours, as I recollect, two or three in the morning, stopped by police. They light up the back that contains the bags with a flashlight, and he maintains enough coolness to persuade them uh, that nothing is wrong and to persuade them to leave him to go on. Is that correct? Yes, sir. The paraphilia is basically defined, it's looked at as a problem, as a mental disorder within the DSM-3R because of the object that is for which the affection or the attraction uh, lies. Is that correct? Not exactly. It's looked at as an abnormality in DSM-3R because people are experiencing something different in terms of their mental state than what's normal. And if you're having abnormal mental experiences, we psychiatrists say that's a mental disorder. It's not abnormal to have recurrent sexual urges or to have recurrent uh, sexually arousing uh, fantasies, is it? That's it's sure abnormal. abnormal to walk around all day having fantasies about having sex with corpses. Doctor, you didn't answer my question. What's the question? The question was, it's not abnormal, is it, to have recurring intense sexual urges and recurring sexual fantasies. That in and of itself is not abnormal, is it? Not necessarily. Right. And for a person, the abnormality that relates why it qualifies a paraphilia is the object of those fantasies. And in this particular case, the object would be, depending whether you accept an unconscious person or a living compliant person or a dead person. In this case, you've made the necrophilia 
started you down that path because there were dead bodies involved with some sex. Is that correct? It is the content of the fantasies, not the object. I, I'm not, I'm saying no, I don't agree with you saying the object. I'm saying the content of the fantasies, having that kind of mental content recurrently running through your head and a content that's associated with intense sexual arousal is abnormal. All right, it's the content being a dead body. That's what the makes sense. The content being all we've talked about, okay? I don't want to repeat because you're asking me to be brief. But all right, all if a person them. simply has this recurrent thing about a dead body, would that qualify as a paraphilia? Recurrent sexual urges, recurrent uh, sexually arousing fantasies, just about a dead body, would that qualify? That would qualify if they're having intense, recurrent, sexually arousing fantasies and urges about having sex with a dead body. The definition included, it wasn't even relevant to say it had to be at least six months. This has gone on here for years. If I'm walking around for more than six months having intense, recurrent, sexually arousing fantasies and, uh, and urges about having sex with a dead body, I got a mental disorder. All right, we got a person now, a human being, that is going around having recurrent, intense sexual desires with recurrent sexual fantasies about a man about an attractive woman that lives next door. That goes on for months and even a year. Is he mentally ill? Got a disorder? I'm not trying to avoid it. I, I doubt it, but you know, you're a hypothetical guy I'm not examining as a doctor. I made the point earlier, we make value judgments. If this isn't hurting anybody else, if it's not causing suffering, if it's not causing distress, it isn't the business of psychiatry to get into the personal thoughts of people that don't cause any difficulty. So if, if he's thinking that, it isn't interfering with his life, it isn't hurting anyone, under those circumstances, no, that's not a disorder. And he wouldn't be a mental disorder? That's, I'm agreeing with you to, to answer directly. Yes, I agree, that would not be a mental disorder. There are many people, are there not? Maybe it's someone that, uh, maybe it's the woman next door or a man with an attractive woman. Maybe she works in the backyard, dresses scantily, he's a normal person. He watches her and sees her relatively frequently, has intense sexual desires, very intense, experiences erection maybe every time he sees her, fantasizes what he would like to do with her, thinks about it, maybe masturbates about it from time to time. And she's there through the years and he's watching her through the years and he wrestles with it, and she's a married lady, and he is not going to move on her, and he wrestles with those urges, and he doesn't move on her. He's not mentally disordered, is he, doctor? I'm pausing because some men would move under, certain, under that circumstance, but I wouldn't say they're mentally ill, no. And there are people that have jobs together, people that are married, one is married to X, the other is married to Y, and they're thrown together by chance and they have a keen sexual attraction to each other, they may never communicate it. They may work for years and out of a sense of dignity and respect and for their marriage and their spouse, they may be powerfully attracted to that woman. Try to push out the fantasy, but they're working with her every day and that fantasy comes back and they're sexually aroused by it and they may dream about it and they struggle with it for years and they don't even express the affection for the other person. They don't even communicate with their eyes. They control themselves and they wrestle with it and those fantasies come back and those desires come back every day and they struggle with it. There are such people, are there not, doctor? Well, I might want to examine that person to see if he's ill. If I ask the average guy if he's walking around all day having to constantly fight off these repeated intense urges and fantasies, he's been doing what, it for what months, you you I tell would me. wonder whether or not he was ill. I wouldn't say based on that he is, but it would be reasonable. He said he's suffering. We got into the ballpark that I said can make you a patient. It would be reasonable for me with this suffering person to wonder whether he ought to be a patient. We'll strike the suffering. He's not suffering. If you start taking enough of it away and make him a normal guy, I'll agree with he's a normal guy. All right, what I'm saying is, and you know what I'm saying is, that there are people that have intense sexual urges, that have recurrent, intense, sexually arousing fantasies. And, and I'm we, saying it, some of them may uh, have about, a About women if it's a man, about one man after another if it's a homosexual, if he's a homosexual, about a woman towards a man perhaps, and we expect those, we don't call them mentally disordered people, and yet their desires are very strong, their fantasies are very strong, and they're not considered mentally disordered for that, are they, doctor? Well, for that, are they, doctor? Well, I think I've answered your question. And the answer is that they are not considered mentally disordered. Is well, that there were correct? several answers because you phrased it several different ways, but I think I've responded. 
the cancer of the mind, and you've explained that it isn't really a cancer as such. It was a term given to you. Yes. We all know that a cancer in the body left unchecked will be perhaps fatal. True? Absolutely. It grows. Mm -hmm. How about the concept of the cancer of the mind left unchecked as a psychiatrist? What would you expect about that? Well, the same thing, and that's why I thought it was a useful metaphor. You know, in our society, we sometimes have the sense if you can't do an x-ray and show it, it isn't real. Uh, depression is real, and people suffer with it, and they describe it, and we can see in their behavior it's reflected, and we as doctors try to deal with it. Mental disability, mental impairment is real in a variety of ways, and there's been so much misunderstanding. Advocates now try to make the point just because the doctors don't have an x-ray yet doesn't mean that mental impairment doesn't really happen. That's why I felt this metaphor of cancer of the mind was so useful. The, the, the mind, metaphorically speaking, can become broken or impaired in a variety of ways. Uh, old people, where, where they become demented. We, we may on x-rays nowadays see that there's certain atrophy of the brain, but before we had those tests, they were still becoming demented, and psychiatrists saw it by seeing changes in personality, changes in intellectual level, changes in functioning. To say that those people, when they got older, were now choosing to misbehave would be to miss the reality that mental impairment is real. That's the point I'm trying to get across by using that metaphor. There's been a lot of uh, discussion here relative to these experimentations of Mr. Dahmer wanting to uh, perform uh, lobotomies, that is, destroying the intellectual portion of the brain, so as to create a zombie-like person that he could use for his purposes as some measure of his not necessarily being a necrophiliac. Can anyone that you know of without great medical training perform the kind of experimentation that Mr. Dahmer started involving himself in to create a zombie-like person in the manner and form in which he tried to do it in his apartment using the type of instrumentalities that he used? Well, again, the answer to your question is obvious. Of, of course not. Now, if a assume that a person came to you and said, what I am doing in my house is using my children for experimental purposes, and I want to create and them into something other than what they are intelligence-wise by destroying their frontal lobe. And what I am doing is drilling holes in their head and pouring liquid down there to destroy their intellectual functioning. What would you think about a person that would come to you and tell you that he was doing that kind of experimentation when he told you that his object is to keep them alive and create zombies. What would you think of that? Well, again, it's obvious. I'd need to be taking a very close look at, at whether or not they're mentally ill. I'd, everybody would have a very high index of suspicion that, uh, that they probably are. And, and then I'd said about what well, we talked about earlier, the business of differential diagnosis to try to get a, a clearer and, and, and more sophisticated sense of what it was I, we, we were I was dealing with. A person who attempts to do that under my assumption is there any way that that person whose brain is drilled by a drill and liquid is poured into it, what's the chance of that person surviving in life? Well, it's, it's, if, if they got immediate medical attention, depends what was poured in, but, but obviously that's a very life-threatening kind of a, of a thing to do. Have you ever, in the history of your course as a psychiatrist, run across a human being who tried to perform homemade sex, uh, lobotomies to create sexual objects? No, sir. Have you ever heard of it? No, sir. Tell us whether or not, based upon your interviews and all the things that you did, if you came up with any other psychiatric opinions relative to Jeffrey Dahmer's personality. Yes, I did. The defendant's personality structure, his underlying way of looking at the world and himself is very primitive. It's diagnosed and meets the criteria for a DSM-3 for schizotypal and borderline personality Tell disorders. Tell us what that means. 
That means that he has long-standing underlying disturbances in how he looks at himself and his relationships with other people. So problems with his self-image, the presence of bizarre ideas and preoccupations, impulsiveness, mood instability, frustration, intolerance. One of the hallmarks of borderline personality is a frantic attempt to avoid real or imagined abandonment. And that is something that was a, a mental process with him on every occasion. Standing alone, is that a mental disease? It can reach psychotic proportions. Those two, those are two personality disorders that can reach psychotic proportions. They are oh. the most serious in that sense. So it can be a mental disease, staying it, alone, it may not be. Right. That takes an investigator like yourself to at least make a, an estimate as to whether or not you feel it's reached that proportion. That's correct. Tell us the other type of personality disorder that you talked about. I think you call it borderline. The, the borderline personality um, is the disturbance in self-image and relationships with others. Um, he has, since childhood, had a disturbance in self-image. He doesn't view himself as a very worthy individual. He can't imagine himself actually having an ongoing adult relationship with someone. So he tries to solve a problem of still needing that by some of these horrible activities. Tell us if you found any other related physical conditions uh, within the investigation that a psychiatrist uh, may do in a case such as this, so bring it to our attention if there were any. The additional, if I've not mentioned, I would have to mention now psychotic disorder not otherwise specified. I believe I did touch on that. I, with think, I think you did in okay. reference to the temple. Yes. This is a drawing by Jeffrey Dahmer of his power temple, complete with skeletons and skulls. Now, you said something about a global assessment of functioning. Is that part of the DSM-3R? Yes, that, it is. That concept? What is yes. that? What do psychiatrists use that for? Well, they diagnosed that on axis five, which is the, the final, uh, the fifth axis, and that they use that to look at the person's overall level of mental functioning. Uh, a, a score of one would be the worst possible score you could get. The number 90 would indicate a level of mental health that most of us would hope to achieve. Okay, and where would you find Mr. Dahmer within one to 90? I found him to be in the lowest range. Uh, I coded him from one to 10, which is a scale, uh, would be the lowest possible score range. What did you see that led you to conclude that? Is this done to a reasonable degree of psychiatric certainty? Yes, it is. Tell us what, what happened that caused you to do that uh, scoring uh, as you saw it, Mr. Diamond. Well, I saw in him a present danger, or, or a correction, a persistent danger of severely hurting or killing others, and some danger of hurting himself. There was behavior that was considerably influenced by delusions, along with extreme impairment in interpersonal relationships. Now you mentioned that the defendant had an underlying personality structure. You used the word extremely primitive. primitive. Yes. Yes. Tell us what you mean by that, please. Well, the borderline personality, for example, is considered to be um, can, can be considered to be a level of personality development. It's, uh, it contains some of the most serious symptoms that cause either distress or interference uh, with uh, our relationships with others. You indicated that you found, because of Jeffrey Dahmer's personal power center that you've described this temple and what he was going to gain from it. Yes. Some psychotic disorder not otherwise specified. Why is that called not otherwise specified? It's called not otherwise specified because there, there, it is specified if it's a definite diagnosis of, of uh, schizophrenia. That's a psychotic disorder with the definite. So that's specified. That's specified. 
Non-bizarre delusions are called delusional disorders, and they're specified. What we don't have a category for is someone that has bizarre delusions like this without hallucinations, so without meeting other criteria for <coughs> an organic or non-organic psychosis. And I, I do want to add that it is not just the power center itself that leads me to the psychotic, not otherwise specified diagnosis. There are other examples of delusional psychotic behavior. Tell us what they are. Those are the, not only the belief, but the attempt to make zombies out of individuals. That is a bizarre, grandiose delusion that he could actually uh, do a crude brain operation that would let, that would make people forget their memory and identity and that they had to leave him and that, that he went out one after another even though these were failing and continued to to try and do such a, uh, a delusional type of a activity okay, anything else the other part would be the cannibalism that is also a very bizarre delusion in that actually storing and, in, and packaging parts of these uh, poor individuals that, that they were going to become part of him. Now what you said... Literally and, and figuratively. Literally and figuratively. Yes. There isn't anything absolutely unique about Mr. Dahmer's sexual desire except that the object of it was an unconscious man. Well, it was a dead man. Which did he say he preferred, live or dead? He said that he preferred having sex with the insides of the bodies. Which that was a 10 out of 10, that's what he told me. Did he tell you what, whether he preferred live men? He did not. What did he say he preferred? The sex with the inside of the body? Yes. And what was the second choice? There was, there was a, a tie with a dead body sex, other types of sex with a dead body or an unconscious body. Well, yeah. has Dr. Crowley said he was psychotic? what Dr. Crowley says. Certainly may. I also told him that if he felt overwhelmed and suicidal and or so disabled by his anxiety that he was unable to do any problem solving, that he should go to the Milwaukee County Mental Health Complex for some inpatient treatment. And finally, despite his history of substance abuse, I will prescribe the anti-anxiety agent lorazepam as well as doxepin for sleep and the depression. So Dr. here, here you have a suicidal patient describing psychotic like possibly psychotic symptoms and nothing is done except if you feel don't if you don't feel better in the morning go to uh, a mental health center for inpatient treatment let me put that to you again doctor dr crowley does not say that he is psychotic no he doesn't he says certain manifestations that you choose to interpret as agreeing with you although no other doctor has agreed with your statement of the number that saw him including your experts, no other doctor has agreed that he's psychotic, have they? I'm going to object to him yelling at him. Why don't you just ask the question? Objection to, his, to the form of the question and the way it's presented with his voice. Doctor? Psychosis is not mentioned diagnostically in any of the reports. Doctor, there's <coughs> only, and I know you have Except mine. Tell us what happens when you get up to the apartment. Tell us what you observed, what your senses told you. Okay, first of all, it seemed like a normal apartment. When we got inside, he turned off burglar alarms. I asked him why. First, it was a foul odor, okay? Tell and us about that. What kind of an odor? It was just like an odor. I didn't quite know what it was. You know, he told me a sewer pipe had broke and management would take care of it. Yeah. And did you accept that? Yes, because I worked around at construction companies before, and when pipes bust, sewer pipes bust, they smell, you know? Okay. So I brought that. So you say he, you, your first thing you did was notice the odor. He opened the door to the apartment? Yes. And you walked in? Yes. He turned off something. What did he turn off? Alarms. Did you ask him about that? Yeah, and he said the part of the neighborhood he was in, he was protecting his property, things like that, cameras, VCRs, TVs, things of that nature. Did you accept that? Yes, I did. 
I'm sorry, I didn't understand what you just said. He, you asked him about some boxes? Yeah, that were laying in the front living room floor. And what did he tell you about those? That he cleaned brick with the mirotic acid. Okay. All right, he wanted to know what your response was to his proposition that had been made downtown. Pardon me? He wanted to get your response to his proposition about prosing in the nude, is that correct? Yeah, eventually he did. Yeah. And what, what did he say? Are you gonna pose, are you gonna take your clothes off, mm -hmm. or what was said? Yeah, he said, uh, yeah, are you gonna, you wanna take the photo, or what, you wanna make the money? You know, so he said it only lasts about five minutes or so, something like that. And what did you tell him at that time? I, said, I still wasn't sure yet, you know, then he suggested the beer. He suggested what? The beer, then we the, had beers. What happened then? Okay, then all of a sudden, you know, I guess he could kind of feel me wanting to leave, so to speak. Did he, yeah. you say that to him? Mm -hmm. Did yeah. you say something? I, was, I guess I was getting restless because I was beginning to move. Maybe he picked up on it, I'm not sure. But, yeah. Do you recall whether you said anything to him that you're gonna leave or let's get going or? No, I, can't, I can't really remember, but uh, I, could, I could kind of guess now, I can tell that he knew I was getting ready to leave because I was finna go, you know, I was finna cancel everything. You know? Yeah. You, you were going to what? I'm sorry. Cancel everything. Cancel yeah. everything? Yeah, I wouldn't even gonna go through with any pictures or anything like that. I haven't made my mind up. Yeah. Okay. And after he put that handcuff on, was there any dis... What did you do? First, I was shocked. I was silent for a moment, maybe. I don't know. And then I asked him what was going on. You know? And what did he say at that time? Yeah, the, if I wouldn't do what he said, he would kill me. Yeah. Did he then want you to pose nude in the handcuffs? Uh, yeah, he wanted me to just, he wanted to handcuff me completely at that point. Right. And you, you were reluctant to be handcuffed completely, yeah. very understandably. Yes. And at that point, did you move into the bedroom? Yeah, I, uh, later, yeah, he said he had a key in there. We eventually wound up in there, so. All right, and you thought you were going in to get the key, is that correct, yeah, in the bedroom? Yeah, he was guiding, yeah, I thought maybe he would just, you know, be okay or whatever, yeah. Okay. And when you got into the bedroom, at some point, this knife was produced, is that correct? A knife was produced? Pardon me? A knife was produced by Dahmer somewhere in this process, is that correct? Yeah, while we were on the couch, yes. Sir. All right. And so he had the handcuff, he was holding your cuff in one hand and a knife in the other. Right. And he moved you into the bedroom saying that the handcuff was in the bedroom, or the key, the, the key was, was in the bedroom? In yes, sir. All right, so you and he went into the bedroom. You sit down on the bed there? Yeah. Yes, and sir. this is where you saw a barrel in the room? Yes, sir. All right, and was there any discussion about the barrel? Not at that point, I didn't say anything. I was more silent, you know. I asked him what was going on, you know, this wasn't necessary. You know, I wasn't trying to hurt him or he shouldn't be trying to hurt me at that point. And uh, then you sat down on the bed and he st and started watching the Exorcist film? Yeah, he told me we should watch that. This is the best movie they ever produced and stuff right. like and that. And you sat down at that time on the bed yeah. with him? Yes, sir. And you were in great fear, no doubt? Yes. There was a man who had a handcuff on and had a knife at your chest or near your chest, is that correct? Yes. And you started watching this film. Was he watching it and you were watching it too? Your mind obviously was somewhere else, yeah. I assume. He was watching, yeah, mostly. And I was more thinking about asking God, why am I here? You know, what can I do? Why am I here? And, stuff. and you were very afraid, I assume. Yes. During this time, he started mumbling something that you didn't understand what it was? Yeah, maybe, yeah, off and on at that time. Maybe Is not exactly. Humming? I'm sorry, you st I think you said humming on direct examination. Yeah, something like that, yeah, some chanting sound, yeah, off and on at times, you know. Okay. And exactly when you start the time, I couldn't tell you. Yeah. And, at, and did you watch the entire film? Is it a couple of hours to watch the mm -hmm. film? It was going on throughout the ordeal, yeah. I can't really tell what, was, what the movie was all about because I wasn't really fixed on it, you know. Okay. Yeah. At some point, you, uh, he wanted to lay on top of you? Yeah, he wanted me to get on the floor at first and lay all the way face down. He wanted to handcuff me at that point, but I wouldn't do it. I more laid on a side angle, and he kind of laid himself across me, you know, put his head on my chest at that point. And... At this point, then, you, you said a third time you wanted to go to a bit to the bathroom. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yes, sir. Right. And what did you do at that point, then? Okay. <clears throat> then I, he didn't pay me any attention, so I kind of, like, grabbed my bag. I picked it up. I had it sitting in between my legs. Then I just raised up, you know. Then I just say, seized the opportunity. Yeah, but I said, I'm going to do it now. At least I'll die trying. You know, right. Did he have sitting. a knife at that point? Um, yeah, but he had just relaxed, let go of the handcuff and everything. Like, forgot I was there, period. Yeah. Okay. And what happened then? 
Okay, and then I kind of grabbed my bag, and then I said, I'm going to try it now, and I kind of hit him, and then I started running towards the door, and, up, and he was swinging at me, you know, and kind of grabbed me back in there. For some reason, I picked the right lock. He only had one lock on the door at that time. Then I just got out of there. <coughs> Tell the jury what various parts you say you saw. I saw a head parked, you know, heads and... Uh, I don't know, maybe you could call it a hand, whatever, things like that. Right. Where did you see the hand? Pardon you me? Say? Where do you say you saw the hand? Uh, he had it, he had one in the bedroom. Yeah. Right. Where in the bedroom did he have a hand? Yeah, in a file cabinet. In the file cabinet? Yeah. Right. And when was it that you looked in the file cabinet? It's when he opened it up, yeah. And he showed you something in the file cabinet? Yeah, he showed me things. Yeah. What did he show you in the file cabinet? Uh, that, the hand, for one thing. And what did he say about the hand? Uh, uh, he didn't really say anything. It was like he wasn't really showing. It was just like he was looking, getting some feedback off it. What did you see in the refrigerator? A head of a person. Pardon? A head of a person. I saw How many heads did you see? I just saw one at that point. Well, was it skull or skulls that you I saw? I saw a skull at that time. So yeah. you didn't see skulls? I didn't see the skulls. No. Did you see hearts? I, I guess it, could, it was shaped like one at that time. You saw one or more? No, I saw this one. What else did you see? Uh, after that point, I like stopped looking, period. You spoke about seeing a video named Faces of Death. Yes. Would you share that with the jury, the discussion you had with them on that? He told me that uh, sometime after having killed Mr. Hicks, and before killing Stephen Tomey, there was an occasion when uh, he discovered uh, some videos, commercially prepared videos, that are marketed under the title Faces of Death. Um, I was familiar with these because it was a fad a few years ago for teenagers to, to rent these, uh, and they are a, a compilation of um, particularly gruesome and explicit real footage of various events around the world. And uh, Mr. Dahmer asked me if I was familiar with those and said that he hadn't told anyone else about this, but that he had watched those videos a couple of times before meeting Stephen Tomey uh, and had rented them from ordinary uh, video supply places. Uh, his description was, Quote, they're pretty gruesome, very realistic. They show, they show people in various stages of death, and they showed an autopsy on one young guy. They cut the skull, removed the brain, cut open the chest area, and removed the organs, sewed them back up. Then they showed executions of World War II and things like that, very graphic. I asked him how many times he'd watched, and he said uh, just once, and that he'd rendered them only once. I asked if he did any rewinding while he was watching, and he said, yeah, I watched that autopsy of that young guy a couple of times. And I asked whether he masturbated during those videos, and he said, quote, during that scene, I think I did get off, end quote. I asked if he thought that the film faces, I asked whether he thought the film faces of death had any effect on him, and he said no, because the thoughts were already in my head, so it didn't give me any new ideas. I asked if it had reawakened any interest, and he said, yeah, it did, that autopsy scene especially, because he was good looking. He was totally naked. I don't know why I happened to have a fascination with that. Did you also discuss with him his encounter with Ronald Flowers on or about April 3rd of 1988? Yes. Would you share with the jury your reflections on that? Mr. Dahmer told me that uh, he met Mr. Flowers in front of the gay bars downtown and offered him money to return with him. Well, this is the incident where the man's car wasn't operating. He had difficulty with his car. That's right. right. Well, uh, yes, th that is the same incident. Uh, he, took, he did take the man back, and as Mr. Dahmer described it to me, he drugged the man in the basement, and in the morning, the man woke up after Mr. Dahmer had had light sex with him. Mr. Dahmer then took $80 from him, walked him to the bus stop, saw him get on the bus, uh, and said, quote, he was really out of it, drugged, and apparently woke up in some hospital, and that was it, end quote. 
I asked him if he thought he was going to get caught for that, and he said, no, because I hadn't hurt him in any way. And I said, well, you drugged him and took money, right? And he said, yeah, I figured they would just think that he just lost the money and that he'd been drinking. And I asked, so that was no big risk to you? And he said, no. I asked if his grandmother had seen him at, with the man, and he said, yes. I said, what was her response? And he said, negative. That's one of the reasons I shortly after that, I moved out to the 24th Street apartment. He had also told the police that when his grandmother saw him with this individual in the basement, he decided not to kill this victim. That uh, such a decision not to kill someone because a witness had seen you with them uh, would be an indication of his capacity to conform his conduct to the requirements of the law and is consistent with what Mr. Dahmer told me about every one of the charged killings, namely that if his grandmother had walked in, he would not have committed the killing. On another occasion, Mr. Dahmer told the police that in the morning his grandmother saw Mr. Flowers there, at which time Mr. Dahmer figured that Flowers was too big and he didn't want to cause a commotion and his grandmother had seen him so he did not kill him, which again is an indication of the capacity to conform his conduct when it suits him to do so. Thereafter he secured an apartment near North 24th and West Wells Street and there ensued on, November, on September 26, 1988, involvement uh, with a juvenile that we have referred to as SS. Uh, would, would, did you discuss that incident with Mr. Dahmer? Yes. Would you share your reflections on that with the jury? Well, he told me that he approached uh, SS because he liked his physique and that he um, brought him back to, uh, under the pretext of taking pictures of him, and in fact did take <coughs> pictures of him, that he <coughs> drugged the young man, after which the, uh, the young man fell asleep. I'm sorry, I uh, um, need to correct that. The young man didn't fall asleep. He said that he did administer the drug, and that after the young man had gone home, he apparently had fallen asleep and his parents had called the police. I don't think that's exactly uh, what had happened because I've read the police reports of what everyone else had to say, but it's, it is the case that after the young man left, he was discovered to be in an unusual condition of, uh, of intoxication and brought to the hospital from where the police were called. Uh, but most importantly, Mr. Dahmer told me that he had no intention of doing SS any harm. And I asked, why is that? And he said, I had to be at work that night. And I said, which meant there wasn't time to really make it worthwhile? And he said, right. Now, I think that is an indication of his capacity to conform his conduct to the requirements of the law in that this was a young man whose physique uh, fit the desired profile for Mr. Dahmer. He had available to him the only apparatus he needed to carry out his usual plan, namely drugs and the privacy of his apartment. And yet he refrained from killing him simply because Mr. Dahmer had to go to work that night and wouldn't have had the time to enjoy the victim's body. So that informs us as to how strong the sexual urge is. It informs us as to um, how readily Mr. Dahmer is able to obey the law uh, when he chooses to do so. Jeffrey Dahmer is here having pled guilty to 15 murders. <clears throat> Jeffrey Dahmer is here because certain doctors indicated that he was insane at the time he committed the offenses. Now we're going to use a lot of words we're going to use a lot of words because a lot of the words say the same thing, but we know what the definition of insanity is in the state of Wisconsin, and you probably can recite it as well as any lawyer who's ever studied law, and that is whether or not a person at a given moment in time 
was suffering from a mental disease and as a result of that mental disease that person lacked substantial capacity to conform his conduct to requirements of law or appreciate the wrongfulness of his conduct. Now the reason for that is clear because some people can conform but can't appreciate and some people can't appreciate but maybe can't conform. There is no wrongfulness of the conduct issue here. It has been admitted, it has been not fought, it has been accepted that I have not been able to sustain my burden of proof from the moment this trial started on the question of whether or not he appreciated right from wrong. He did. So I'm here to talk to you about whether or not this mental disease that we have proffered was met to a reasonable degree of certainty by the greater weight of the credible evidence. And if I have shown that, and I don't mean I like I'm on an ego trip, my job is, if I have achieved that, then the next question is, as a result of that mental disease, did he lack substantial capacity to conform his conduct to the requirements of law? And I submit to you, that's the only question that you're gonna have to wrestle with because the mental disease was proven to a reasonable certainty by the greater weight of the credible evidence. You know, we got a lot of a la carte Americans in this country. They, they, they want to rewrite the Constitution. They really want to rewrite the Declaration of Independence. They want to tell you, well, in this kind of a case, forget justice. Come on, he killed all these people, forget it. It's all over with. He doesn't deserve the time of day. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. They're boat people, that's what they are. They should get on boats and get out of here and go live in a country where that kind of stuff goes on. It doesn't go on in America because we live in a country where we all are entitled to liberty and justice. And justice is met by your verdict. Not by what I think, not by what Mr. McCann thinks, not by what these seven doctors think or the judge thinks, it's what you think. That's what justice is. And whichever way you call it, it's justice as long as we subscribe to the oath that we took. I have tried in order to keep this thing to a, some kind of a logical explanation, drawn up the Jeffrey Dahmer human being. And this is what I see about this Jeffrey Dahmer as a total human being, a person who's in the fantasy, drugging, keeping skulls in locker, cannibalism, sexual urges, drilling, making zombies, necrophilia, disorders, paraphilias, watching videos, getting excited about eggshells, drinking alcohol all the time, into a dysfunctional family, trying to create a shrine, showering with corpses, going into the occult, having delusions, chanting and rocking, picking up roadkill, having obsessions, murders, lobotomies, deflecting, masturbating four, three, four times a day, two, three times a day as a youngster, going and trying to get a mannequin home so he can play sex with a mannequin, masturbating in the open parts of the human being's body, calling taxi dermis, going to graveyards, going to funeral homes, wearing yellow contacts, posing people who are dead that he killed for pictures, masturbating all over the place. This is Jeffrey Dahmer. My little star, my little circle, would say lawyer, father, sports, happy. I have only positives. There isn't a positive thing on this. This is a young man who never had a relationship with another male on a friendly basis for a day's time. This is a boy who at the age of 15 or 16 found himself sick. And if it's so simplistic that too bad, so bad, he could have done something about it. It's his own fault, so anything that happened after then is his own fault. Then we're not talking about justice. Then we're talking about a lot of other things. We're talking about just neglecting the realities of life. But if we look at a guy who's sick and say just how bad was that sickness, then we're doing justice to the question, whatever the result of the question is. This is a 15 count murder case. You've got three experts, never, none of them testified in a murder case before. Dr. Fred Berlin has testified on responsibility seven to nine times, seven to nine times on responsibility. 
and has never testified on responsibility in a murder case. Never testified on responsibility in a murder case. And he is the only identified forensic psychiatrist by Dr. Dietz who subscribes to the idea that a paraphilia is a defense on a responsibility issue. He is the only one, Dr. Dr. Dietz said, that he knows of that would say what this man has is a defense to a murder case. Hence, he's appearing here for his first experience is testifying on non-responsibility in a murder case. Dr. Becker, a nice lady. Dr. Berlin as well, in terms of treatment, yes. Dr. Becker has never testified on responsibility. She told you, not just in a murder case, she has never testified on anything from disorderly conduct upward. Never testified on a murder responsibility case. Dr. Wallstrom, never testified on a in a murder case. Dr. Wallstrom completed his training, his fellowship, although he'd been a doctor several years, he completed his fellowship in July of 1992. He is less, today when he testified, he was less than seven or eight months out of his training period. Less than seven or eight months out of his training period. He had never testified in a murder case or a robbery case or a burglary case. He has testified once before He's testified on, a, on an exposure, in an, an indecent exposure case. So between all three of the defense experts, you've got Berlin seven to nine times, you've got Wallstrom once, so that would make that 10, and you've got Becker never. So 10 altogether among the three of them, they've testified 10 times on responsibility and never testified in a murder case. You gotta shake your head on that one and say, hey, what's going on here? What's going on here? You've got a defense, you've got Dr. Berlin heading the team, raising a defense that Dr. Deist said the forensic psychiatry community simply does not support. That's what the defense is here. And you have to ask why these totally, almost totally, well on murder, among, among three of them, 10 appearances as for, uh, on responsibility, among the three of them, we brought to this courtroom hundreds of experiences through Dr. Dietz and Dr. Fosdell. The court appointed Dr. Palermo with hundreds of times. You think the court would appoint someone six months, eight months out of training? What do you say about that? Eight months out of training. You've got to seriously weigh that and say, what's going on in this courtroom with a serial killer, 15 murders charged, at least 17 that he's involved in, and we wind up with three experts who have never testified in a murder case and altogether have only testified 10 times on the issue of mental responsibility. What's going on here? Jurors, I am now going to read your verdicts to you, after which I will make inquiry of you as to whether or not, indeed, I have accurately read the verdicts to you. In the state of Wisconsin versus Jeffrey Dahmer, case number F912542, a special verdict. Question one. At the time the crime was committed in count one of the information in regard to the death of James E. Dockstader, did the defendant, Jeffrey L. Dahmer, have a mental disease? Answer, no. There are two dissenting jurors. As to question one, as to question one, it's signed by, as the foreman of the jury. State of Wisconsin versus Jeffrey L. Dahmer, case number F912542, special verdict, question number one. At the time the crime was committed in count seven of the information in regard to the death of... The jurors' counts, names have been deleted to protect their anonymity. Have a mental disease. Answer... Now, they only had to answer question two, two questions. Number one, answered. did he have a mental disease? And if he did, number, number two, one. could he control himself? 
right now they are answering to the first question and if they find that he did not have a mental disease then they don't have to answer the second question State of Wisconsin versus Jeffrey L. Dahmer, case number F912542, special verdict. Question number one. The time the crime was committed in count 15 of the information in regard to the death of Joseph Bredehoff, did the defendant, Jeffrey L. Dahmer, have a mental disease? Answer, no. <laughs> Question number two need not be answered. Dated at Milwaukee, Wisconsin, this 15th day of February 1992. Perhaps it can best be said in St. John chapter 15, verse 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Edward Warren Smith tried to be Jeffrey Dahmer's friend. As a result, he lost his life. Mr. Dahmer, Eddie's gone now, the victim of your senseless killing. Where do we go from here? We ask ourselves. Why did this happen to a person like Eddie? He gave so much and asked so little. All he wanted was a chance to be himself, a chance to be happy. When all the facts are known, we hope that society will have gained some knowledge that will help prevent a tragedy such as the one Eddie suffered. Despite the fact that you had the knives, the saws, the bats, the acid, the drills, and possibly a gun, even while he was in a semi-conscious state of mind, you didn't give him the chance to fight for his life. You took his life like a thief in the night by cutting his throat. Rather than facing him and let him fight for the thing that he felt most dear, you took the coward way out. Did you ever stop to think that this was someone's son? Did you ever stop to think that this is someone's brother, nephew, uncle, cousin, grandson, or just someone's friend? My name is Shirley Hughes, and I'm Tony Anthony Hughes' mother. First of all, thank God and to give thanks to the judge and to Mr. McCann for the verdict that came in. I would like to say to Jeffrey Dahmer that he don't know the pain, the hurt, the loss, and the mental state that he had put our family in. You took my 17-year-old son away from me. I'll never get a chance to tell him that I loved him. I'd have a chance to tell him that I loved him the last time I saw him, which will be a year tomorrow. You took my daughter's only brother away from her. She'll never have a chance to sing and dance with him again. You took my mother's oldest grandchild from her. And for that, I can never forgive you. You killed my brother, Richard Guerrero. You also killed my father and my mother's youngest future. And my three brothers' lives, including my life, my husband, and my three children, will never forget this tragedy that you inflicted upon us. Therefore, I would like to end my speech by saying in my language that, Jeffrey, you are el diablo, el puro diablo que estaba suelto en las calles de nosotros. That means the devil, the pure devil that walked our streets and was loose. So, Your Honor, please, I beg you, don't let this man ever walk our streets or see daylight again. This man should never be able to walk the face of earth or to be able to harm anyone else again. I want a few more things I wanted to say in my heart. I want to thank the jury for seeing this man for what he is, a sneaky, conniving person that if he had a chance, he would constantly do this again. So I thank the jury for seeing this man for what he is. I want to thank E. Michael McCann, district attorney, for being there with the family, seeing the family suffer this way, and to realize that we all have feelings on the, for the Bredos family, as much as love in our family closed, my mother gave five beautiful kids. We lost, he destroyed the baby of the family. And I hope you go to hell. I love this world. You guys did a wonderful job. Bottom of my heart, thank to God, I'm, I got a lot of strength. Thank you all. Hello, my name is Marilyn Sears. I'm the mother of Anthony Lee Sears. And I just wanted to know, you know, just why, you know, why would it be my son, you know? 
Um, I just want to thank E. Michael McCann for the good job he did. Well, you did a good job too, but I'm glad McCann won it. And I want to thank the jury, and I want to thank you, Judge. And just keep this man off the street, please. My name is Rita Isbell. Ma no, ma'am. You'll address the court first. My name is Rita Isbell, and I'm the oldest sister of Errol Lindsay. Jer whatever your name is, Satan. I'm mad. This is how you act when you are out of control. I don't want to ever see my mother have to go through this again. Never, Jeffrey. Jeffrey, I hate you, mother. This has never been a case of trying to get free. I didn't ever want freedom. Frankly, I wanted death for myself. This was a case to tell the world that I did what I did not for reasons of hate. I hated no one. I knew I was sick or evil or both. Now I believe I was sick. The doctors have told me about my sickness and now I have some peace. I know how much harm I have caused I tried to do the best I could after the arrest to make amends, but no matter what I did, I could not undo the terrible harm I have caused. My attempt to help identify the remains was the best that I could do, and that was hardly anything. I feel so bad for what I did to those poor families, and I understand their rightful hate. I know I will be in prison for the rest of my life. I know that I will have to turn to God to help me get through each day. I should have stayed with God. I tried and failed and created a holocaust. Thank God there will be no more harm that I can do. I believe that only the Lord Jesus Christ can save me from my sins. I have instructed Mr. Boyle to end this matter. I do not want to contest the civil case. I have told Mr. Boyle to try and finalize them if he can. If there is ever any money, I want it to go to the victims' families. I have talked to Mr. Boyle about other things that might help ease my conscience in some way of coming up with ideas on how to make some amends to these families, and I will work with him on that. I want to return to Ohio and quickly end that matter so that I can put all of this behind me and then come right back here to do my sentence. I decided to go through this trial for a number of reasons. One of the reasons was to let the world know that these were not hate crimes. I wanted the world in Milwaukee, which I deeply hurt, to know the truth of what I did. I didn't want unanswered questions. All the questions have now been answered. I wanted to find out just what it was that caused me to be so bad and evil. But most of all, Mr. Boyle and I decided that maybe there was a way for us to tell the world that if there are people out there with these disorders, Maybe they can get some help before they end up being hurt or hurting someone. I think the trial did that. I take all the blame for what I did. I hurt many people. The judge in my earlier case tried to help me, and I refused his help, and he got hurt by what I did. I hurt those policemen in the Conorak matter, and I shall ever regret causing them to lose their jobs. And I hope and pray that they can get their jobs back, because I know they did their best and I just plain fooled them. For that, I am so sorry. I know I hurt my probation officer who was really trying to help me. I am so sorry for that and sorry for everyone else that I have hurt. I have hurt my mother and father and stepmother. I love them all so very much. I hope that they will find the same peace I am looking for. Mr. Boyle's associates, Wendy and Ellen, have been wonderful to me, helping me through this worst of all times. I want to publicly thank Mr. Boyle. He didn't need to take this case, but when I asked him to help me find the answers and to help others, if I could, he stayed, stayed with me and went way overboard in trying to help me. Mr. Boyle and I agreed that it was never a matter of trying to get off. It was only a matter of which place I would be housed the rest of my life 
not for my comfort, but for trying to study me in the hopes of helping me and learning to help others who might have problems. I know I will be in prison. I pledge to talk to doctors who might be able to find some answers. In closing, I just want to say that I hope God has forgiven me. I know society will never be able to forgive me. I know the families of the victims will never be able to forgive me for what I have done. I promise I will pray each day to ask for their forgiveness when the hurt goes away, if ever. I have seen their tears, and if I could give my life right now to bring their loved ones back, I would do it. I am so very sorry. Your Honor, I know that you are about to sentence me. I ask for no consideration. I want you to know that I have been treated perfectly by the deputies who have been in your court and the deputies who work the jail. The deputies have treated me very professionally, and I want everyone to know that. They, they have not given me special treatment. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of who I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive an eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. I know my time in prison will be terrible, but I deserve whatever I get because of what I have done. Thank you, Your Honor, and I am prepared for your sentence, which I know will be the maximum. I ask for no consideration. Count 15, uh, life imprisonment with parole eligibility to be 70 years after the inception of that sentence to be consecutive to count 14. I, I have believe I have and I intended to follow the recommendation of the state, I, I could have said something different which would have had the same impact. I really see nobody gains anything by just to say more and more years. The important point is that the sentence is structured in such a way that this defendant will never again see freedom. That is owed to this community in order to protect the community as well as acknowledgement of the seriousness of the offenses. Those are the reasons. The sentence, of course, is to the state prison system. Uh, I, one thing I didn't provide, all of these sentences are consecutive to the time he's presently serving. What's your uh, client's reaction? What was your reaction to the statements of the families in the court today, and particularly the outbursts? Uh, well, let me tell you about, the, about all of them. I, I think they were... Uh, those people showed great dignity today, and uh, even the, the lady and her outburst was most uh, expected. I had anticipated that maybe there would be more of that, but uh, uh, the outburst, in my opinion, was uh, appropriate. I, I uh, always try and judge other people by what I would do in the same or similar circumstances. So I think that all people uh, showed the appropriate dignity, and the outburst was not unexpected and uh, when I mentioned to Mr. Dahmer when I went back to him and I said you all right he says he says I can understand why that happened I, so there was no oh my goodness that shouldn't have happened kind of thing so I'm happy this is over and I suspect for some reason you're probably happy too you've had such gracious accommodations here from Milwaukee County very pleased, obviously, with the verdicts that the jury handed down. Very pleased with the sentencing by the judge. I'm very confident that Mr. Dahmer will never again be on the streets of any city in the world. What's your understanding of the sentence? How long? What is it? Well, the first two are, are life plus 10. We would not qualify for parole except for 13 years on the first two counts, which would be 26 years. On the remaining 13 counts, it would be 70 years before parole consecutively on each count which I compute to be 910, so you're talking about 936, 937 years. For uh, yes, for parole. Our state statute, however, on sentencing in the last 13 counts has not yet has been attacked at the highest level, nor in the federal courts, but even if it were successfully attacked, certainly the 13-year rule would apply, so you're talking about well over 130 years, so there's no likelihood of him ever being released. The way it stands now, 936 yeah. years. That's right. He would be eligible. Yes, eligible after 9.30. But Methuselah himself would feel diminished.